So I did have a guy um, who was living in this house. And I'm gonna start by saying that, that I still love this guy and I see him and I always ask him how he's doing. And he relapsed. Um, I got up one morning and I went to use the, the bathroom sink and it was clogged. I pulled the, the, the cap out and My name's David, I'm an alcoholic. I've been an alcoholic since age 17, really. I started drinking when I was in high school. I did more than just drinking, I did a lot of meth, coke, I did a little bit of everything. Um, I grew up, um, well, I've been on my own since 14. My mom put me out at 14. She was a drug addict, alcoholic, prostitute. No father in the house. I've had uh, quite a few DUIs, um, possession charges. What landed me in, in LA jail was I had a forgery charge. And it was right after high school. And that was uh, back in 94. I was locked up in LA with OJ and the Menendez brothers. Not on the same block, but yeah. And it was a crazy time. That was my first time in jail. And uh, I spent, well, I was sentenced for a year and I did uh, nine months at Wayside in California. Well, after I got out of jail, I ended up moving to Las Vegas and, and I really was just searching for myself, not knowing what to do. I ended up landing a good job with the airlines. And so I moved from state to state and I finally moved to Virginia when we started flying out of here. And I retired with Southwest in 2004 as an early retirement. And my drinking got real bad then, but my mom was also sick. So I moved back to Arizona to help take care of her. Uh, you know, I found out when you move places, there's still alcohol there. And my addiction got, got so bad. Um, I moved back here in 2006 and just kind of lost everything after a while. Well, man, it's just like this. You, you start with so much. You know, as a kid, I, I always said I wasn't going to be in the same position as my parents were. You know, drug addicts, alcoholics. And I ended up as a drug addict and alcoholic. And even though I worked good jobs, my addiction took over. And it got to a point where that's all that mattered. You know, first thing in the morning when I woke up, I wanted to drink. And it got to a point where I couldn't function without having a drink. I couldn't, I couldn't shave, I couldn't do anything until I had a drink. I got to a point where I was drinking on the job, right after the job, I'd sleep, go to the bar, and that was my routine. And I got so depressed and so, so down, I was at a point where I you know, wanted to kill myself. And it was a time that I tried to commit suicide. I was blessed because I ended up at the Hampton Crisis Center and I met some good people there. I spent 14 days and I was able to detox. And that was scary because if you've never detoxed off, off of alcohol or never detoxed at all, I thought I was going to die. And that was one of the worst feelings of my whole life. I met some good people there that gave me some options. They said, you know, you can continue and die or you've got a, you know, you've got a chance to, to change your life. And they said, you know, you can go into the Salvation Army. And I didn't know what Salvation Army was. They said, it's a rehab. And I said, do I got to ring bells? And they said, no, it's not a ringing bell kind of deal. You go and you do some work and, you know, there's counselors. So that's what I did. And I went there. I was scared. I was sober. I didn't know how to be sober. As a matter of fact, the, the day I went, I said, I told my brother who dropped me off, I said, you know what, man, the bar's open at 6 a.m. Let's go. Because I just, I don't feel like I can do this. And he, he looked at me dead in my eyes and said, no, get out of my car. <laughs> and um, so that's what I did. And I gave it a shot. And in that process of accepting help, I was able to 
find a church and a meeting and people that actually cared about me. Um, two weeks into the Salvation Army, I, I was invited to this meeting called Exchanged, and it's at the church I go to now, Providence Friends Church. And I met this guy there that was leading the meeting, and, and he made some sense. But the thing that he told me was, if you keep coming back, I promise you it'll work. Now, you don't know me, but in my life, I've, people have made some promises to me that, that, that never got kept. And so it takes a lot for me to trust somebody. It did. I said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this guy a shot. And I kept coming back. And the more I kept coming back, the more it made sense. The more I was able to find out about myself, you know, why I started drinking, you know, the abuse in my life. Uh, the mental, physical, sexual abuse that happened as a, as a child. I was holding on to that. I had resentments and I had, I had these emotional issues. And working with, with my sponsor, who he became my sponsor, I was able to open up and able to let God work inside. You know, one of the things he said was, I have this wound <laughs> and, sorry, all I've been doing with alcohol in my, in my drinking and drug use was just putting a Band-Aid on it. So I had to open up the wound. And we had to let God heal me from the inside out. And in that process of working the steps and working the exchange group and going back and doing what I was supposed to do, I was able to get some, some peace and some healing. My time in the Salvation Army, I spent 10 months there. And when I left the Salvation Army, uh, I ended up going back home. Um, but I wasn't ready yet. Um, there was still alcohol there. Even though I was attending my meetings and, and talking with my sponsor, I, I, I needed something more. I needed some more accountability in my life. And so I got into a, a halfway house. I got into an Oxford house. And at the Oxford House, uh, I, you know, there was rules. I had to attend meetings, which I had no problem with. But I was able to, to work at, at the halfway house and earn an income, unlike the Salvation Army. And I was able to be accountable to other people. I was in charge of things at the house. Everybody had a role. So I made some friends in recovery there. Um, you know, we had a curfew every night which to me was good because I needed the curfew. And today I always say there's nothing you should be doing after 11 o'clock at night. Where before I wouldn't come home until six. And so I needed the halfway house. I needed the, the stability. I needed to be there. And I believe that God wanted me there to learn about halfway houses and, what, and how important they are in the recovery process and how we need community in our life. Because the guys that I, I met at the Oxford House were, were good people. Now, don't get me wrong, we had, we had our squabbles and, and disagreements, but in the end, it was a place that really helped me. It was a place that, that taught me I could be sober and live life again. And they gave me a shot there. They gave me that, that, that chance that I needed to get going. Uh, so the halfway house had, a, um, had rules, like every, every place, every halfway house, they do have rules. Um, there's no drinking, there's no drugging, there's, um, you know, there's a limited time on the guests that are there. Everyone had chores that they had to do. Um, you know, the worst one was, of course, cleaning the bathrooms. But uh, so you, you, you had these different chores you had to do, you had to attend meetings, you had to attend chapter meetings. And you had to, to be a part of the house. Um, you know, there was times where, you know, you, you didn't wash a dish and someone was going to be on you. Because that's part of living life. Part of living life is, is doing what you're supposed to do. And in the halfway houses, that's what they teach you. Or they, you know, they try to instill into you is to pick up after yourself, go to work, pay your bills, which you're also required to do in the halfway houses. And be a productive citizen. 
Um, it's also a spot too where you could start working on some of that wreckage that you've created in your life. In the halfway houses, you could start getting some, some clearer thinking and with, with other men around you that have been through it, you're able to start paying off some fines and taking care of some licenses and, and child support and things like that. So the rules at the halfway house were really there to help you. When I was in the Oxford house, uh, one of my friends and I had decided that we had been in, in the Oxford house. It was our time to make a transition. And halfway houses are transitional homes. You know, you, you learn to, to get out and live on your own. And they help you with that. So we made the transition. Him and I ended up getting an apartment together. And we made that transition. Um, after a while, I transitioned to getting my own apartment. And through the exchange meeting that I talked about earlier, I, I had met some guys that weren't in a good spot yet. And with the help of my pastor, um, you know, he had a vision for halfway houses and, and helping guys. And I really felt like, like God placed that on my heart too to, to help out because I had been helped out so much. And so in my one bedroom apartment, uh, we took in our first guy. He was locked up for a while. He was living in a, a Kano lodge and he needed a place to go. And so that's where, where really it started was in a one bedroom apartment with two guys. And right after that, I really felt that God said, you know, you gotta, you gotta get more. You can help so many more people with what you know and what I learned at the halfway houses. So we started looking and that process was grueling. Um, you know, you get a bunch of guys that have backgrounds trying to look for a place legitimately, you know, through realtors, and it was tough, but we had the trust, and we had to have faith, and eventually, we got a shot, we're given a house, the house that, that we're in right now, and we we're able to start our friend's faith house, and with five guys in this house, when we first started, it was a little tight, but we had faith that we'd get another house. And through this process, we have three houses now. And the houses are running great. We've got guys that we're helping coming out of incarceration, rehabs, um, you know, from all over. And guys are really doing good, changing their lives. We've got some real success stories here. And it's because they've worked the program. Our houses are similar to Oxford houses um, in where we have rules and you have to pay your equal share of, of the rent and, and do chores. The one thing that we have that a lot of other houses don't is that ours is a faith-based house and we require that you go to church and you attend our, our Christ Center 12-step meeting exchanged on Saturday nights and we have a Tuesday night Bible study. Also, we believe that we can't do this without each other. And so we believe community, and not just community in the houses, but the community at church and the people that we surround ourselves around. You know, I tell guys when they come in, I said, don't expect a TV in your room because we only have one, and that's in our living rooms, because we want you to eat together and commune together, and, and we want to know how your day was. You know, the guys that come in the door after work, I want to know how your day was. Anything going on today? How can I pray for you? And they do the same for me. You know, come 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, I'll get a phone call from everybody. Not because they have to. Because they want to check in. They want to see, you know, they want to tell me about their day. Hey, I just started my brand new job and I'm doing great. Or, you know, I just got a promotion. Hey man, I'm getting my, my license back. And these guys are, that are working the program are doing great things. And I've been blessed to have the opportunity to go through this addiction and these hard times and Salvation Army and Oxford House because it has all been preparation for what we do now. And I believe that this is, the, you know, this is a way for me to stay sober. So has it been easy? No. 
Has has it been a learning experience? Yes. You know, when you're when you're dealing with guys in addiction and and different personalities, you really have to be open minded to all sorts of people. And we've had guys that just aren't ready for this. You know, I said it this program works for those that work the program. Let's face it, guys aren't ready sometimes. We've all got a con in us still. You know, we've been on the streets, we've been in our addictions, we've been in, in prison, we've been in jail, and we've got that. We've, we've got a con in us sometimes. And guys come in for the wrong reasons. Some guys may just need a place to stay. Or here's one I get. I just need to show my girl that I'm doing better so she takes me back. Or if I get a job, then I'll be fine. But really, when they're not working a program, that job and that girl, they still end up going back out. And so we have, we've had some, some difficult um, people. We've ran into some, some housing obstacles. Uh, we've run across a lot of different things but you take them day by day, just like our recovery. It's, it's one day at a time. You know, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot about, about personalities. I've learned a lot about, about different drug uses, you know, and how people react and how people, how a heroin addict is different from an alcoholic. And, you know, how a guy that's popping pills is different from both of them. You know, you, you learn to see patterns of behavior in these guys and that helps me help them because then I could see where problems may occur so yes we've had problems and I'm sure that we still will hey, I've got guys coming out of prison pretty soon and this is the first time that I've had any long-term incarcerated guys coming out and I'm sure that there's going to be some difficulties with that I take that back. I do have one guy that just moved into the house and he spent 25 years. And so I'm, I'm working with him and I realize that the way that I speak to him is, has to be different than I speak to another person. For him, it's a lot more of respect. I'm not saying I, I disrespect anybody, but he requires more attention. So yes, we've had our, our, our stumbles. We've had our we have learning curves, and uh, that just makes us better. That, that, makes, that makes us all better, including the guys that are in the house. So um, the guys that are, have been just released and are coming into the house, um, it's a, a definitely a process for the guys, for the guys that have spent one or two years, to the guys that have spent five, 10, 25 years, it's different. Um, there's a lot of adjustments uh, that need to be made. There's a lot of things that the guys want to do that when you come into a programmed house, you just can't do. You know, you can't go out and, and, and spend a weekend with just anybody. Um, you, there's a lot of uh, things that they want to do that they, they can't. And so that kind of upsets them a little bit. So there is that, that uh, uncomfortableness. When they come out, um, it's hard for them to find a job. They think it's hard for them to find a job. Um, they have a lot of doubt in themselves. Um, they think that no one's going to hire a felon. They, they don't know how to ride the bus system. They, they don't know where to start. A lot of guys don't even know how to get on the internet and fill out an application. And so what we do is we, we help these guys with, with that. A lot of guys are proud too. They don't want to ask for help. Um, you know, they'll sit there and they'd rather sit there and be hungry than ask for help. And so it's breaking down those walls too, that we're here to help. Um, it's okay. You know, you've done your time and, and now it's time to, to start making something more of yourself, to better yourself. You know, you, know, you got family, invite them over. Invite them over for a cookout. We want, we want guys that are coming out to build those bonds with their family. We want them to, to get jobs. We want them to be better people. And we want to help them with that. The adjustments for the guys coming out is, uh, can be difficult. So we've been really blessed with, 
with folks that have helped guys with employment. Can I say their names? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Randstad in Virginia Beach. Uh, Matt Spillman has been uh, a great help. He says, you know, they have an ID and a social security card. Get them here by three. I'll have a job for them the next day. Advanced temporary services. Um, Trish, she's great. She says, send them over here. Be here by 5 a.m. and be patient with me and I'll find you something. You know, we've got a, a, a guy from church, Dan. He has his own construction business. He's been helping guys. And so we haven't really had a problem helping guys find work. It's the problems that we have are the guys that don't want to find work. Finding work hasn't been a problem for the guys. We help them with bus passes, we help them with food, we help them with food stamps, um, go online and fill out all that information for them, and they usually have that within a week. Um, IDs and social security cards, when they do come and they don't have those, we help them get those. Um, we help them fill out resumes or, or you know, get a resume made. Help them with the phone, we've done that. Um, so we offer some services that other halfway houses don't. And I like to say because they're our family. You know, this is, I don't like for them to say that they're coming to a halfway house. I like for them to say they're coming home because that's what this is, it's home. Up until recently, we've been working with a lot of guys coming out of Virginia Beach Jail. And that's because uh, Pastor Mike teaches there every Wednesday. And he has some good connections there. Um, he goes into the LEP block and the substance abuse block, and he talks to guys. He teaches them um, the 12 steps. That's how we've been getting guys there. Now, recently, we've just joined the reentry committee, so um, working with Paula Dillon, uh, part of the DOC, we've been getting referrals from uh, Deerfield and Indian Creek. We've got two guys coming within the next three weeks. Uh, they're going to be great assets to the house. Um, their counselors at the correctional facilities have made the time and taken the effort to, to contact me so I can phone interview them, give them the spiel on, on everything that we do here at the house and what's required of them. And we've got two good guys getting ready to, to come here in the next three weeks. And I think they're going to be assets to the house. But initially, um, when we got started is because of the work that has been done in the Virginia Beach jails. So I did have a guy um, who was living in this house and I'm going to start by saying that that I still love this guy and I see him and I always ask him how he's doing and he relapsed. Um, I got up one morning and I went to use the, the bathroom sink and it was clogged. I pulled the the, the cap out and there was a cap to a syringe and I know what it looks like so I went to his room and I woke him up and I said man you gotta go and it broke my heart but he didn't reach out before he used and we have a zero tolerance for using or drinking in, in the houses and so I told him man you, you, you gotta go we give you 30 minutes to pack up as much as you can and then we hold your stuff for two weeks you know so you can come back and get it and I told him I said man you gotta go I said please don't act like I'm a fool you know what you did I know what you did and I laid the cap on the dresser he didn't give me no problems he was sorry he cried I cried with him and it was, it was heart, heartbreaking, and he had to go. I said, I see him still. I always give him a hug. I always tell him I love him. I ask him how he's doing. You know, he, he always asks how the dog is doing. And we're still friends, but he's still using to. For an individual who's just coming home, what if he can't afford, how much was it a week, 125 125 a week. So if this guy has no money and he can't afford this, do you require that? Or do you say, hey, look, you know, we're going to help you and then you just pay us back? Or do you give them any kind of a grace period? Well, what we do is we ask for uh, two weeks up front. What we have done is uh, we've let guys come in and make that up. 
uh, with their, their first check. Um, but like the guys coming out of prison, they are being funded for the most part through, actually through, <laughs> by the church. You don't go to a lot of churches, and I, I, I can't, I guess I'm not an expert at this, but I know that our church, I'll just speak for our church, is so open and loving and welcoming of everyone and have supported all the guys in this house and all of the houses with prayer, finances, food, clothing, um, extra stuff they, that, I mean, we couldn't ask for a more generous church, but our bills are, are high. So we do ask for a deposit in any other donations. So when a guy comes home, he has a certain amount of time to find work. Is there anything that you want to talk about with that? Like how long do you require, what's the grace period for a guy to find employment? I guess the grace period to find employment uh, is two weeks. We haven't had anyone not find employment that has wanted employment. You know what I mean? Everybody that's wanted a job has found a job. The guys that haven't found a job, well, those are the guys that are just making excuses. I need a job that pays $25 an hour because I have child support. Man, it doesn't cost a lot to live here. So two weeks is what we usually give. With the resources that we do have and the amount of footwork that we put in to help these guys, you know, it's, it's enough to help them find a job. What I've learned uh, the most is to be patient, to have faith, to believe and trust in God that, that things are going to work out and that even though I may not see it, that there is a, a bigger purpose and plan here and that I'm just a, a small cog in this. I believe in people. I believe in, in rehabilitation. I've learned that even some of the guys that are, that are really rough around the edges can be some of the best people you could ever work with and have friendships with if you give them a shot. We give people shots here and when others won't. And they're changing their lives. And I'm, just, I'm just happy to help them. Of course I want to see this grow. I want to see Friends Faith House Nationwide, you know, I want to see men's lives changed. I want to see, I want to see more houses, uh, larger facilities. I would love to be connected with the state. All I want for myself, I guess, is to see, be able to see men's lives changed. I'd love to see these men, you know, come out of here and just their relationships with Christ just blossom and their love for others just go beyond anything else. And. I'd like to see these guys help more guys. I don't really have a goal for myself, but to just keep doing what I'm doing. I'm happy right where I'm at. Could I see more for, for the future of Friends Faith House? Absolutely. But I just want to be involved. I just want to help the next guy.